Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Hirsch. I'm the CTO and co-founder of The Browser Company, and here it is. This is what y'all have been asking for. Uh, this is Arc on Windows. Um, <laughs> it's not really much to look at at the moment, admittedly. Um, but uh, there's some interesting things about it uh, that I would love to talk about. Uh, and so this actually uses the same code and language as Arc from Mac, um, which is kind of an insane thing to do. Uh, not that many people do it. I don't think anybody has really tried it in a production setting so far. Um, and I would love to tell you more. So thanks for being here. Um, my co-founder uh, had a presentation on the internet computer uh, a few months ago. And he talked about our vision for what we're trying to build at Arc, which is this internet computer that's on every platform. And it's a little silly for him to talk about this without us being on the world's most popular desktop operating system, which is Windows. Uh, and so we have to be on Windows if we're going to achieve this vision. And so today I wanted to announce uh, we're starting work on Windows and we're going about it a kind of crazy way that I'm going to talk about. Uh, and, and to be honest and be vulnerable, we have like a 60% chance of nailing this. So things have a very high chance of going awry and you could hear me in another video file in a few months, sort of tail between my legs, apologizing that we're taking so long. Um, but I wanted to share with you and be vulnerable about how we're going about this because it's kind of cool uh, and hopefully you guys will enjoy it. So where to begin? Um, uh, browsers are hard. Browsers are very complex, very large pieces of software. And you know, when we were going about starting to think about building Arc, uh, we were looking at the other browsers out there and most browsers out there are actually built um, in C++ in this language called C++. And so here, this is Chromium's code. Uh, it's all in C++. C++ is kind of a gnarly language. And you know, most browsers are built with this. And so we were thinking about, okay, do we want to go this route or not? And it didn't really seem like a fit um, for a few reasons. One is that C++ is kind of gnarly to write. You know, it has unbelievable performance. It's cross-platform. So it works across Windows, Mac, and any other platform, well, most other platforms out there. But it takes a while to write anything in it because it's quite verbose and you have to know a lot of the details about C++. So that's one problem is if we're trying to build a whole new browser where we're iterating very quickly to try to figure out what products we want to build, it's not the best choice. There's this, you know, one thing I talk about often, uh, you know, when talking to people about how we built Arc uh, is uh, this idea we realized pretty quickly that a lot of what we think we want to build in terms of features and what ends up being interesting, that Venn diagram, this Venn diagram here, kind of barely overlaps. So we have a lot of ideas what will be cool and then what actually turns out to, you know, people like using, it just doesn't, it doesn't overlap. And so we realize pretty quickly, we have to iterate very quickly and try a lot of things to actually figure out what will be really interesting features in a whole new browser. And that requires a language and a tool set that allows us to do that. And C++ just isn't that. And so that was one realization. Another thing is that C++ actually for a browser specifically has a lot of security concerns. And so if you Google UAF Chromium, actually it pulls up a whole lot of security issues. UAF stands for use after free. And use after free is this uh, common security problem in Chromium uh, that causes a lot of vulnerabilities. And it's because uh, C++ is, has manual memory management, uh, which means you as an engineer, as a developer, have to figure out how memory is allocated. And, and that, you know, you make mistakes and in a very, very large code base that are like a browser, those mistakes really add up and cause security issues. And so it's really important to us to find a language that would, that had automatic memory management. And so we were thinking about this, okay, how do we go about this? And because we were building for Mac first, we realized actually the obvious choice was to use something uh, like Apple Swift language. And so Swift just is beautiful language, really well designed. It's really performant, almost as performant as C++, which is necessary for a browser. But it also has a really good developer environment and allows you to iterate very quickly. And crucially, it has automatic memory management. So, you know, this was an obvious choice for us. It made a lot of sense. And it really got us to where we are now, where a lot of people are using Arc and excited about it. But there's a catch. It only works on Apple platforms because Apple built it. And so uh, it's on Mac OS. It's really useful for iOS, but it doesn't help us on Windows. So what do we do on Windows? So we were thinking about this 
uh, and trying to suss out where we go from here. And uh, we're looking around and, um, you know, what Microsoft recommends is using C Sharp, uh, which is like the Microsoft language for building apps. And C Sharp, it's actually a lovely language. It's really beautifully designed. Uh, you know, it gives you a lot of features for building apps, but it has some caveats as well. One of the main caveats is uh, C Sharp actually runs on something called the CLR, the Common Language Runtime. And this means that unlike Swift or C++, it's not native, uh, which means it doesn't actually compile down to instructions that run on the CPU. And this means there's a little bit of a performance issue uh, when you're running something as complex as a browser. So it's never gonna be quite as performant as Swift. Uh, they're working on this. There's some native compilation out there, but it has a lot of limitations. Uh, and so this is one problem. A bigger problem for us specifically is that we have a lot of code written in Swift already. And so we really don't want to write everything twice, especially in something like a web browser. You know, a web browser is incredibly complex. There's a lot of pieces in it. And we're only a few years in. You know, the arc you see now is a very nascent version of the arc that will exist in two years, in five years, in 10 years. We have a lot of ideas for stuff we want to add. And so the code base is going to grow dramatically. You know, our code base is probably 5% of the size it's going to be eventually as we really figure out this vision for an internet computer. And so writing it all twice is really problematic, especially in a world, you know, where we want a uh, very fast iteration uh, and a lot of that really tight iteration speed uh, that's necessary for building new products. So we were thinking about, okay, what do we do here? And we had a wild idea. What if we just use Swift on Windows? Uh, nobody's really done it before, but we have a little bit of a pathway forward. So we started looking into this uh, and trying to suss out what we do. And September of 2020, uh, the incredible uh, Salim Abdul Rasool actually got Swift mostly working. So the language actually runs on Windows and it has for a little while. Um, Salim is just an absolutely incredible human, an incredible engineer. Uh, and so over the last, you know, six or eight months, we've been chatting with him, uh, you know, getting to know him and getting to sort of figure out, is this feasible? Can we actually use this to port our existing Mac OS browser onto Windows? This would have a lot of benefits. You know, it's the performance is great. It's a really productive language, um, but Swift runs on Windows, but there's a lot more work to be done. You know, I, one example is, you know, I, I, I can't say enough about how much work Salim has done already, uh, but it's not quite there yet in terms of productionized. Um, one big thing is Swift has a bunch of new features like async await that they just launched, which are very, uh, really good features for productivity, but they just don't work on Windows yet. Uh, there's a lot of compiler work to be done to get them there. Uh, and so this is just one example. Uh, but another example is the fact that, uh, you know, Xcode uh, is something that we use to program on Mac OS. You know, for all its faults, there's a lot of things to complain about about Xcode. It's actually a beautiful environment and it just works. And that just doesn't exist with Swift on Windows either. So there's the language features that we have to build. There's the development environment we have to build. Um, there's IDE support. And there's stuff like, you know, if you're a Mac or iOS developer, instruments is one of the big things that we use on Mac OS and iOS to really make sure the app is performant, there's no memory leaks, it's a suite of tools. And again, that just doesn't exist on Windows either for Swift. And so there's a lot of work here, there's compiler work, there's uh, developer tooling work, there's instrumentation and like tooling, uh, tool chain work. Uh, there's a lot of these instruments we have to build out, but it's enticing. You know, if we can get it done, that means we can share code across platforms. Our browser can be one big code base, similar to Chromium or Firefox or the other browsers. We don't have to write things twice. And if that code base is gonna be huge, we can have our developers focus on productivity and focus on actual features rather than worrying about how do I build this in C++ or how do I build this twice in C Sharp and Swift without sharing code. Um, where this idea really came to us was this, you know, we learned about this approach um, from a architectural decision that Facebook made actually many years ago. So um, back in the day, you know, when Facebook and Twitter and Foursquare were starting out, um, I wanna talk about hack here. 
they built their initial uh, backends in very productive languages, similar to Swift. Uh, you know, Twitter and Foursquare were built on Ruby on Rails, and uh, Facebook was built in PHP. And as those companies started to scale, they realized, oh, these languages are just too slow. We can't work with them. You know, we need to get to something that's really scalable. And back, you know, in the 2000s, they were really trying to figure out what is the approach here. And Facebook took a very different approach from Twitter and Foursquare. Twitter and Foursquare decided, hey, let's just rewrite everything in a more performant language, which is the sort of reasonable thing to do. You know, like, hey, Ruby on Rails is too slow. Let's actually rewrite this in Scala because it's just going to be a bit more performant and it's more scalable. Cool. That's what they did. But they took on a huge cost there on the product perspective. You know, they had to rewrite all of their code. The product engineers really slowed down. And, it, you know, long term, it really cost them a lot. Whereas Facebook actually really focused on protecting their product engineers. You know, if we want to build the best product possible, we have to not slow them down. And that's a lot of the same business considerations we have, like where that's why we use Swift in the first place. We are trying to build a browser that is really thinking about pushing the envelope in terms of product. And so we cannot slow down our product development. And so Facebook's approach was interesting, which is like, what, what if we go a layer deeper? You know, what if we don't change the product code that much, but what if we just built a faster compiler for PHP and changed incrementally the language to be faster rather than switching languages? And so they built this, they built the HHVM compiler. Uh, you know, they had, they had a previous one and this was the second version and then they built Hack, uh, which was this language on top of uh, PHP, but it added static type checking and a bunch of performance things that then helped the compiler get faster. And so this was genius, you know, it, it was a huge technical undertaking similar to Swift on Windows, but it went one layer deeper and tried to figure out, okay, can we actually change the layer underneath this at the compiler level in a way to protect our product iteration? And this seems like the best option for us as well, even though it's kind of wild and has a probably 60% chance of success. Um, and so that's the route we're taking. And we, you know, it's a lot to figure out and a lot to do. Uh, but thought we'd share it here today. So this is actually not the only problem we need to solve. There's a whole different one I want to talk about. Um, but this is sort of the, the really technically complex one we have to figure out. Whew. So that's one thing. It's figuring out how are we actually getting Swift to work on Windows? Is it feasible? Uh, and we're doing that with a very experimental, very incremental approach of running a lot of experiments and de-risking at an incremental basis so that we don't go down this rabbit hole and realize, oh my God, in a year, uh, this is not going to work. Um, there's a separate problem of how do we build UI in Windows in a way that really feels like a Windows app. I think one thing that people love about Arc is just the animations, the fact that it's so accessible. It feels like a modern app, you know? A lot of these uh, animations here in your library just feel really nice and feel like a Mac, a Mac app. And that's really, really important to us on Windows as well. It's really important that we do that there. And so we were looking around, how do we do that in Swift? Uh, because Windows is not really like Mac. Mac is like, you got to use Swift UI as your thing, and it's productive. Uh, and so that's what we've built a lot of um, our, our Mac OS UI in, this uh, language called Swift UI. Swift UI is beautiful because it's declarative. Uh, and so that means it allows you to iterate very, very quickly and try a lot of things. Uh, and so we were thinking about, okay, how do we build UI on, on Windows? Uh, and just to give you an example, you know, most, oh, you know, our test app crashed. So uh, as you can see, we're very early in <laughs> figuring this out. Uh, you know, most Windows apps are built using this thing called Electron, uh, which is just a Chromium wrapper. And so they don't really look and feel like Windows. And we want all of the Windows stuff, you know, Windows gives you in their native UI toolkit gives you this like acrylic see-through thing that we really want to use. Um, and it gives you all of these um, other sort of uh, dialogues and boxes to make it really, even the pickers to really feel like Windows. And to be honest, no other browser actually uses this. Even Edge, Microsoft's own browser, see their dialogues, if I go to this and actually, you know, their dialogues look like Chrome. Uh, they don't actually look like the Windows dialogues. You know, if I actually go to Windows, uh, and open a dialog, it looks like um, a Windows dialog. It looks native to the platform. And it's so important to us that Arc uses the native Windows design language as we're building it out, because that's what makes it feel 
like a, something you want to use and something native to the platform. And so that's a huge other part of this we got to figure out is how do we actually build uh, Swift bindings and, and a Swift uh, library that wraps uh, the native Windows UI toolkit, WinUI 3, uh, and gives it a declarative syntax that allows us to iterate very quickly. And so we have a lot of crazy ideas there too. Uh, we have a lot of fun actually thinking about these things as we're de-risking this. Uh, and that's sort of another part of building Swift on, uh, sorry, Arc on Windows. As we suss out, okay, how do we build this framework for building a browser so that in one year, in two years, in five years, we're still building features at the same velocity and with the same integrity and the same experience that we do on Mac, but across uh, platforms. And so, you know, if we really nail this, uh, we'll have a, a browser written in a performant language that is really quick to iterate in uh, and that looks and feels like a native Windows app, which no other browser on Windows does. Um, and that's wild. Uh, and that's, that's the dream. Uh, and so, you know, I don't, I don't think I've seen any other company our size where 45 people uh, pull something like this off. You know, it's compiler work, it's tool chain work, it's, it's operating systems work. Uh, but I think if we do, uh, we'll, we'll really set the stage of what browsers can be in the future uh, and we'll build a, a cross-platform app in a way no other app has really been built before. And so we're very, very excited about this initiative. Um, and I really, our hope is that this is really helpful for the Swift community as well at large. You know, we intend to open source most or all of our work uh, at some point as we work on it, once it's in a stage that is actually usable. And so hopefully we're really helping the community as we go along with this. We're building a new way to build cross-platform apps and really setting the stage for how browsers are built in the future as well. Uh, you know, especially with some of the memory management stuff, really can build a more secure base uh, for web browsers in the future. And so, um, you know, again, this is not a hundred percent thing. We're trying to be vulnerable and share the kind of work we do. Uh, and so we have probably a 60% chance of really pulling this off. And you, you might see me again in a few months being like, oh, that didn't work, uh, but we'll see. And so uh, maybe I'll leave you with, you know, if you are excited about work like this, if it interests you, um, if you're excited about building sort of the future of, of web browsers and how an internet computer can be built, um, and especially if you're excited about, you know, Swift and compilers and Windows operating system work and tool chains and developer experience, uh, please, please reach out to us. I'm at Hirsch, H-U-R-S-H on Twitter or Hirsch at thebrowser.company. Just reach out if you have advice, if you just want to chat, um, I love, love meeting people in the community. And so, uh, you know, anything, uh, please, please give us a ring. Uh, but uh, thank you for listening. If you've listened to this video this far uh, and excited to share more in the coming months.